Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hanega High School. Today we'll be continuing our notes with Chapter 7, looking at other trends like ionization energy and electron affinity. Now, ionization energy is the amount of energy required to remove an electron from the ground state of a gaseous atom or ion. Now, one thing that we do differently with ionization energy is we look at multiple ionization energies and compare them. So it's a new kind of trend rather than a cross-down trend. Is looking at how would the first compare to the second and so on. Now, the first ionization energy is the energy to remove the first electron. So for something like a sodium, elemental sodium in its gaseous state, um, since we're removing an electron, electron is going to be one of our products, which means we lost an electron. Now we have the sodium ion. So this is what the equation would look like for what we're describing here. So the first ionization energy from sodium would be to remove one electron from the neutral sodium atom. Now the second ionization energy is the energy required to remove another electron. So the second ionization energy from sodium would be the energy required to remove an electron from the Na plus ion. So now we're going from Na plus to Na2 plus an electron. So when you're looking at how first ionization energy compares to second ionization energy, hopefully it would make sense that we have the same number of protons, so nuclear charge is the exact same, but we have fewer electrons, and sometimes those electrons, we've lost our valence electrons, which are farther away, so there should be a big difference in energies for multiple ionizations. Now, it requires more energy to remove each successive electron. So after we've removed one, now we're trying to remove an electron fighting the same nucleus with fewer electrons. And um, typically, I mean, fewer electrons mean less electron to electron repulsion. The nucleus is going to have a greater hold on what's left. So ionization energy increases when you go from the first to the second to the third to the fourth. And you can see that on the table here. For sodium, 495 to 4,500 and 62. For magnesium, 738 increases to 1451, increases to 7733. So it always requires more energy to remove the next successive electron. Now, when all the valence electrons have been removed, a huge jump in ionization energy occurs. And that's the blue shaded region that you see here. At each of these spots, you see a dramatic increase in the amount of energy it takes to remove. And that's an important idea because if it's a dramatic increase, that means it's harder for it to happen and it's less likely for it to occur. So what tends to happen is substances lose electrons until it becomes more stable and then it's very, very hard to lose any more. Why are they becoming more stable? Because there is a huge difference in energy to remove any other electrons. So it's unlikely that it's going to happen, and therefore you're going to end up losing that many electrons. So that's going to drive really what your charge of cations is going to actually be. So why is magnesium a plus two cation? Well, that's because once magnesium has lost two electrons, it's a huge amount of energy to pull out a third. So that means magnesium is going to lose two electrons, and from there, it's not going to lose anymore. So now you're going to make a more stable ion at that point. So it's all about the fact that um, when you've removed interlevel p electrons close to the nucleus, uh, there's going to be a much higher effective nuclear strength, making it much harder for them to remove. So um, what you need to understand, I, get, I said that wrong. I think I said interlevel p's. If you're removing an outer level electron, like an outer level s or an outer level p, well, as you remove it, it gets harder to remove more electrons because you've got the same strength nucleus holding on to fewer electrons, which means less electron to electron repulsion. You're eventually going to get to the point where it goes through a huge jump. Well, what happened at that point? Well, you lost your last outer level S. Now we're trying to pull from an inner level P, which is significantly closer to the nucleus, and that means that nucleus is going to have a significantly greater hold on them, and it gets much, much harder. So that's really the idea, is we've pulled off our last outer level S, and now we're pulling out an inner level P. So much higher effective nuclear strength on those inner level P electrons. So you need to know how to do, because this is a common AP question, you need to know how to use what's happening here with ionization energy jumps to predict the charge of an element based on that data. So if you had some unknown element X, and we didn't know it was aluminum, all we knew it was element X, and you were given this data right here, because the big jump happens after I've pulled out three, and when I try and pull out four, it's a huge jump. 
that tells me that this is going to be stable as a plus 3 ion. So that means it would be something like aluminum or gallium or anything from that family, so to speak. So this is an important idea for on the AP test. It's a common thing for them to ask you about the significance of the big jump. And really, that's why many of the ions that we look at on the periodic table have the charge that they do as an ion. Now, as you go down a column, less energy is required to remove the first electron. And remember, that's because atoms in the same group, the effect of nuclear strength doesn't really change much. So what's going on when we're going down is the fact that you have a much greater distance from the nucleus as you go down. Greater n means it's easier to remove those electrons based upon Coulomb's law. So once again, we're talking about a group trend. We're going back to what's happening about n. Now we looked at size. We just said it's farther from the nucleus. As you go down, it's bigger. In this particular case, what we're looking at is the fact that as you get farther from the nucleus, the nucleus has a weaker hold on you by Coulomb's law. Remember, distance kills attractive forces by Coulomb's law, so it gets easier to remove electrons. So when you go down, it's because of increasing n makes it easier to remove electrons by Coulomb's law. Distance kills attractive forces. Now, as you go across, it generally gets harder, and that's because as you go from left to right, effective nuclear strength increases. So when you go across, it tends to increase. Now, there are some anomalies, and if you look, the anomalies seem to be happening in a very predictable way. So this is one of those anomalies I want you to have an understanding of in case you're asked about this in an FRQ question on the AP test. Now, when you look at this situation, there seems to be a set of anomalies that are happening here and here and here and here, and then there's a set of anomalies that are happening there. That's a predictable anomaly. Something must be happening very consistently in those same spots within these uh, families, or I should say within these periods, for there to be a discontinuity. So why is it dropping in those places? Well, it's for a very predictable reason. First, you look at what happens when you go from 1A to 2, or I'm sorry, from 2A to 3A. When you go from 2A to 3A, if you look at the periodic table, you're looking at going from something like beryllium to boron, magnesium to aluminum. Notice you were in an S and now you're going to a P. Well, what's happening here is the electron we're removing from a P orbital um, is easier to pull out than the electron removed from an S orbital. Because remember that P orbital has shielding electrons. The S electrons, and if you're in the third period and below, there's also D electrons that are there shielding. And that provides some shielding to make it easier to remove the P electrons. So S electrons are technically then a little bit harder to remove that second S electron than to pull out the first P. And that's because the shielding effect that those inner shell electrons um, inside your S and inside your D, even on the same energy level, um, they are going to shield more effectively the P electrons than anything else. So those P electrons, uh, there's an energy, it's, it's easier to move them out because the, of the shielding effect that the S and sometimes the D electrons provide. So remember, everything is about you know, effective nuclear strength and shielding and attraction maximization and minim, uh, repulsion minimization. What's happening in this particular trend right here is really about the fact that um, those S electrons and sometimes D electrons are shielding the P electrons. Well, that's decreasing effective nuclear strength and making it easier to pull out those electrons. Now, the second discontinuity is what happens between groups 5 and group 6. Now, what's happening here is a slightly different situation. Now, what we have here is a P4 electron situation. Now, if you recall, when we looked at our P sublevel, so when we're on the two Ps, we have three 2Ps. When we're on the third level, we have three 3Ps and so forth. Well, when you are dealing with pulling out electrons, there's a different situation when I'm pulling out electrons from a situation like this. So based on where group 5 is at on the periodic table, so if you're counting over, we start with lithium. That's group 1, beryllium group 2, boron group 3, carbon group 4, nitrogen group 5. So we're looking at the difference between nitrogen and oxygen. This is what oxygen would look like. And this is what oxygen would look like. There's a difference between pulling out this electron and pulling out this electron. And what's basically happening is this is a second electron in situation. Now, 
when you have a second electron in an orbital, you have increased electron to electron repulsion. So that increased repulsion makes it an energy advantage. It's a little bit easier to remove this electron right here than it is to move, remove that electron right there. So that increased electron to electron repulsion caused by having two electrons in that first 2p made it a little bit easier to pull it out. Now, technically, that same thing can happen in the other situations, but that's more than outweighed by what's happening with increased effective nuclear strength. So once again, then the trend goes right back to getting harder to pull it out. So what we're looking at is two anomaly type situations. What happens here and what happens there? And they are slightly different situations. Now, next one we're going to look at, and this is what we'll finish on as electron affinity, is the energy change that's accompanying the addition of electron to a gaseous element. Think of this as kind of like the opposite of ionization energy. Ionization energy is the energy we have to spend to yank out an electron. Electron affinity would be the energy involved when we add an electron. Now, in general, except for noble gases, nothing else has the right number of electrons. So just as a general statement, most things are then looking to, in, in essence, gain electrons to get like a noble gas. Now, granted, cations, it's easier for them to lose than gain. But as they're gaining electrons, um, there is typically a bigger drop in potential energy, and it does get a little bit easier. So what you're looking at with electron affinity is just how much energy is involved when we add an electron. Now, in the case of chlorine, it's negative 349 kilojoules. So in other words, it releases energy. That must mean our potential energy was dropping. And many of these are exothermic. So in most situations, as we add that electron, we end up with a lower potential energy situation, and energy that difference gets released. So in general, electron affinity becomes more exothermic as you go from left to right as, across the periodic table. So the general trend is it increases in um, how exothermic it is as you go across. Now, as the ion approaches a noble gas configuration, remember, you're going across, effective nuclear strength is increasing. The ion's becoming more stable, and the potential energy decreases, um, releasing more energy to the surroundings. So as we're going across, we've got a bigger drop in potential energy. More energy is being released as we get closer and closer to the noble gas configuration. Now, how come is it that the noble gases were endothermic, not exothermic? Remember, the extra electron we're going to put in argon needs to be re uh, placed in a 4s orbital, which is significantly higher in energy than the 3p orbital is. That increase in potential energy is going to require energy. So we have to put energy in. It's endothermic to cause noble gases to pick up an electron. Now, there's three general discontinuities that you can see here. These are actually, the first two are, are similar in idea to what was happening in the last situation. Now, the first thing you can see is when you go from group 1A to 2A. Now, before we were talking about 2A to 3A. Now we're looking at 1A to 2A in electron affinity. It was negative 60 for lithium. Now it's greater than zero for beryllium. It definitely did not decrease it, or I should say it didn't become more exothermic. It actually became less exothermic and became endothermic. So what's happening there? Now, remember, we're looking at S electrons here. That's really what we're looking at in lithium to beryllium. We're adding another S electron. Now, S electrons and also um, D electrons, we're dealing with group 3 and group 4 and below. Remember, S and D can be on the same level as the P. And those electrons can cause shielding, making it a little bit different for the P electron situation. So when we're talking about adding an electron here, all we're really doing is filling our 1s. When we're talking about adding an electron here, going from that substance to that substance, now we've got S going to P. So to put an electron into beryllium, we've got to add a P electron. Now, that P electron is higher in energy because of the shielding provided by the S and sometimes the D. So that means it's going to be harder to do that. It's a higher potential energy situation. That difference in potential energy means it's going to be significantly less exothermic. In fact, in the case of beryllium and magnesium, it's actually endothermic in those two. This should sound familiar to what we talked about before. So this is the exact same thing in a similar part of the periodic table. So the added electron that we're looking at when we put one into beryllium versus we put one into lit um, lithium, it's going into a p orbital, not an s orbital. And remember that p orbital is shielded by s and sometimes d electrons, and therefore it's higher in energy.
Now the second discontinuity is going on here between group 4A and 5A. And remember, here we're adding to a brand new empty sublevel orbital. So we're on the same sublevel. Each of these are going to be a P. So this would be our negative 1, 0, and 1P. But when we're going to this one, now it's going to be putting a second electron into the same orbital. And that's a different situation between carbon and nitrogen. And that's really what it causes that, uh, next, uh, that next anomaly. Group 5A doesn't have any empty orbitals. So that extra electron is going into an already occupied orbital. And that's going to create more electron-to-electron -electron repulsion. That's an energy disadvantage. So that's higher potential energy, less stable. So that means it actually is going to be less exothermic when we go from the group 4A to the group 5A. And once again, that's similar to what we talked about before, but we're looking at it from the opposite point of view with ionization energy. Now, the last anomaly I want to mention here, and this is one students sometimes confuse. So, so the second bullet's going to be really critical here. Fluorine is also an anomaly. Fluorine's small size really causes a very strong electron-to-electron -electron repulsion. When you have electrons very close to each other, they're going to repel more than electrons are, that are farther away. Fluorine is a very, very small atom. So the electron-electron repulsions get magnified in fluorine. And that's going to make it less likely to attract electrons. Well, since we've got a, a lot of electron-electron repulsion going on, to shove one more in there is going to be a higher potential energy situation. Now, don't confuse this with what we're talking about with electron activity, because most of you remember from last year, fluorine is one of the strongest in electronegativity, or the strongest electronegative element in the whole periodic table, and then it's electron hog. It's great at grabbing hold of electrons and holding on to them. That's different than what we're talking about when we're actually talking about putting the electron inside there. So when you're sharing electrons, you're not actually forming an ion. So when fluorine is getting together with a metal, that's a whole different situation than when we're talking about with electronegativity. What we're looking at is the actual formation of the ion itself, not how great it is at sharing and holding on to electrons from other things, which is what electronegativity is. So don't think this goes against what you were thinking about last year with electronegativity. That's because sometimes people confuse electronegativity and electron affinity. Electron affinity is literally putting an electron and making the ion. Because of the increased electron-electron repulsion caused by this very small atom, you'll notice it is very exothermic compared to oxygen, but it's not near as exothermic as with chlorine. And that's because chlorine, the electrons are farther apart. You're putting it into a region of space with less electron-electron repulsion. So that's really what we're looking at here. This doesn't go against what we talked about with electronegativity. It's really just looking at this specific situation of making the ion itself. Yes, it's very exothermic, but notice it's not quite as exothermic as chlorine was. And that's why it's a little bit of an anomaly here. And that finishes our second set of notes over Chapter 7.